6, verse 31. When I look at January for 30 years as pastor, and this is going on 31 years now, I think of business. It said, I'm a business mind. Jesus said, I must be about my father's business. There's some business involved in the gospel. Now listen to me. In the book of James, he mentions, Be ye doers of the word, not hearers only, thereby deceiving yourself. When you're a hearer only, you deceive yourself. Now, if you don't know where the verse is, in the book of James, you look it up. The word hearer in the Greek is the word audit. Have you ever audited a class? To audit a class means that you set in on it, but you did not apply it. In other words, you just were involved in the entertainment of it. You heard there was a great lecturer, teacher, professor, amen. And so you just showed up and you got, you just wanted to hear him or, or watch her or, or just, just see how they did it. You audited the class. Now, if you paid for the class and you took notes on the class, you did what you heard in the class. Everybody follow me? So Jesus, or James was saying, be ye hearers, excuse me, doers of the word, not auditors only. What happens in church oftentimes, it's not the pastor's fault people leave church. It's not the worship leader's fault people leave church. What happens is congregations start auditing the class, and all they do is show up to hear, but they don't apply what they've heard. So James said, you're deceiving yourself because you're not being a doer of the word. How many know that's already good preaching? So being a doer, Tommy, is a powerful thing. So as we move through what Jesus taught us, I call it the divine priority. His priority for us on this earth is out of the book of Matthew chapter 6. Are you comfortable? That's not a really good pleasing picture of me there, but hey. I look, I look. Mad. I'm not mad. I'm wearing my glasses in. That's where I got my eyeballs put in. I want to tell you something else. I, the other day I, I was realizing just how well I'm able to see at night. I'll start tearing up again. I thank God for these new uh, specs they put inside my eyes. Implants. When I get raptured, they'll stay on the earth. So are your new knee socket and hip socket and everything else they've added to you. <laughs> Do not worry about saying, what shall we eat? Mm. What shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? I'm always reminded when I read this that the people Jesus is talking to probably had two sets of clothes. Ask yourself, how many sets you got? If I took you to my house and showed you our closet, every woman in this house would be envious. Hey, ladies, if you've already seen our house, lift your hand if I'm telling the truth. My closet is our old bedroom. Yeah, we went from a four-bedroom to a three-bedroom. My wife turned our old bedroom into closets, and every little cubby hole has stuff in it, packed. And I get rid of stuff all the time. But here, Jesus said, don't, don't worry about what you wear, because we all have plenty to wear. Then he walks on and says, don't worry about what you eat. Then verse 32, he said, for the pagans run after all these things. And your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. I have found that everything I need is in the kingdom. And Jesus said, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Talking about the kingdom on the earth. I posted something this week that so many in the church world is all concerned about going to heaven when we ought to be trying to get heaven to earth. When we need to get the kingdom to earth. It's about having the kingdom on earth. If we're all planning on leaving here, how are we going to be the salt and the light of the earth? Amen. The world needs salt. The world needs light. And, when, and so I want to just say this to you right now. Heaven don't need you. We need you. We need you to stay here as long as you can until God exits you. Can I get an amen? Father, I thank you for your word. Anoint my lips to share it, our hearts to hear and receive. And God, I pray that you don't, uh, don't allow us to audit any more classes. It's time for us to be doers of the word. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, Amen. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. We're going to be moving through this month of fasting. 
it's equally important to consecrate ourselves. And you got to ask yourself, God, what is it you want? What is it you want of me? And I know many of you say, now, Pastor, you do this every, every year. Every year I have. Every year for 31 years, I've taught on fasting in January. And it's, so, it's such an important time to me. And you say, how can you get excited about fasting? I can tell you why. Because first off, it helps me get in control. It reminds me that as I went through Thanksgiving and Christmas, I kind of let myself go a little bit. And though I have been able to uh, watch myself a little bit more, there are times I, I, I've looked around and said, my goodness, preacher, you're eating way too much. You're drinking now. When I say drinking, you understand I, it ain't alcohol. But I, I, I just drink and eat and, and, and watch and do. And, and so now it's time to pull back some and deal with it. I believe that God's highest priority is restoring the kingdom of heaven on earth. It is the why Jesus came, to live among us for a time. Jesus preached the kingdom of God, taught the kingdom of God. It was central to everything he did and said. And everybody needs to hear this, for it is what they are seeking. It's the kingdom of God from heaven on earth. Now, uh, I mentioned this Wednesday night. And Tuesday night, that as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. It's the way you think that changes you. You think it changes you. Now, it, when I went to uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma many years ago, I heard a man preach. He was a little Bahamian man from, from, uh, from uh, the, the Bahamas, and I was blown away. His name was Miles Monroe, and I sat there and listened to him. I had Pastor David Hilton with me of Dayton Christian Center. I had Pastor Richard Amador with me of Sun Harvest Church. These were my friends, and we went there, and we were just preachers preaching about what we've heard and, you know, talking to, about sheep and about how you are sheep and the, Jesus teaches me that you are sheep and, and then a sheep leaves the fold. I'm supposed to chase after you and take you back and, and leave everybody else and I'm supposed to look at. But then, then he got up and he began to challenge my thinking. He said in the beginning, Jesus said, take dominion over the earth. And then he said, sheep don't take dominion over nothing but grass. And I got to listening to him, and I thought, first off, you challenging the way I think. I went to college. I wrote a 50-page thesis about shepherds and sheep. And, I, I mean, that's how I got my bachelor's degree. We all about sheep. As a matter of fact, the best thing we can do is help people understand they sheep. That way we can control them. That way we can keep them in the fold. That way we can tell them that without the shepherd, they, they, they are wor worthless out there. And then all of a sudden, he starts challenging me. He said, no, we're not sheep. I ain't been a sheep in a long time. He said, I read with Jesus as the lion of the tribe of Judah. As the lion of the tribe, the tribe is not a whole bunch of sheep. And then he starts talking about a Walt Disney character. He walked into the Lion King. Y'all remember the Lion King? Amen. If you've got grandkids or kids, you have seen it. If you don't, you're just an adult that likes cartoons. And I watched The Lion King and that old, what was the name of that little bitty lion? Was, huh? Simba. And Simba was raised up around a bunch of uh, well, sheep, I guess what it was. And then he went out to the water and he bit down in the water and he saw his reflection in the water. Remember that? And when he saw himself in the water, across the way was what? His daddy. What was his daddy's name? Who? Mufasa. And then when he saw Mufasa, Mufasa growled at him and it scared him because he thought he was a sheep. And he looked down in the water and he saw himself and he saw his daddy and he realized, I look like my daddy. And as he began to look at him, all of a sudden, Arr! and then a growl came out of him and he realized he wasn't a sheep. He was a lion. And what happens in our lives as believers, we realize we're not sheep. We start out as sheep, but we don't stay sheep. We go to become lions. Lions are not the biggest thing in, in Africa, but they are the king of the jungle. They ain't scared of hippopotamuses. They ain't scared of big elephants. They ain't scared of nothing. Amen. Because they're a lion. And lions take dominion over their area. Lions mark their area. Lions petition off their area and make sure that nothing else jacks in that area. And all of a sudden, my thinking begin to change. That lions take dominion. Lions are owners. Lions look after one another. Lions are, they have pride in what they're doing. They live among pride. They protect one another. They protect their young'uns. 
Everything shifted, and I thought, sheep don't do none of that. Sheep want to be coddled. Sheep want to be petted. Sheep want to be called. Sheep want to be looked after. Lions say, I got this. I'm a doer of the word, not just a hearer only. So he's the lion of the tribe. The tribe is not sheep, but they are lions. Changed my whole thinking. And if any of you were back with me, and that was some 10, 12 years ago, you'll realize that everything changed in our church. Everything shifted in our church. It was like a shift. It shifted in Pastor David's church, Pastor Richard. Why? Because we changed the way we thought. Now, my friend is now going to be with Jesus in the kingdom because he's the first guy that taught me about the kingdom of God. And that shifted my thing because all I thought about was us going to heaven. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. Meanwhile, down on earth, we said, while we sat here, we ought to be rejoicing here too. Can I get an amen? Amen. Because amen. this is the kingdom of God on earth. Amen. We got to bring the kingdom here. Now, that's not some cultish thinking. Amen. As a matter of fact, the more I read about Jesus, I read, he kept talking about the kingdom, the kingdom of God. He just kept bringing this thing up. So he told us, this is how you should pray. Matter of fact, again, Matthew chapter 6, he said, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be the holy is your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth. As it is in heaven. So has heaven, whatever's going on up there, let it be going on down here. See, religion, religion, see, and I've been in religious churches. Religion is what man does until he finds the kingdom of God. Religion prepares man to leave earth. The kingdom empowers us to dominate the earth. Religion focuses on heaven. The kingdom focuses on earth. Religion is reaching up to God. The kingdom is God coming down to man. Religion wants to escape earth. Get us out of here, God. We don't want any persecution. Each Sunday, I've been talking to you. Over 50,000 African Christians have been murdered by the Boko Haram over the last 10 years. Murdered. And nobody has raised a finger. I haven't heard anything in the States about it. We see it in the Middle East. We see what's going on because we want out of here. We want out of here. And God said, I ain't letting you out of here. I'm telling you, there will come a day in America where we may face persecution. And if you're not a doer of the word, it's going to run right over you. That's why I say stay prepared, keep your gun. Can I get an amen? Amen. I started carrying my more. Religion wants to escape earth. The kingdom impacts, influences, and changes earth. Religion seeks to take earth to heaven. The kingdom seeks to bring heaven to earth. Matthew 23, verse 13, Jesus said, Woe to you, teachers of the law, you preachers, you Pharisees, you hypocrites. You shut the kingdom of heaven in men's faces. You, uh, you yourselves do not enter, nor will you let those enter who are trying to. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You travel over land and sea to win a single conquest. And when he becomes one, when he becomes one, uh, you make him twice as much the son of hell as you are. Would you say, Jesus? You just called the preachers and the Pharisees sons of hell. My goodness, that's strong talk. He said, what you do is you make them like you. The reason you want to make them like you is so you can control them. It's all about control. You're going, to, you're going to do the law. You're going to do as I say. You're going to give what I say. You're going to act as I say. Amen. But we're going to do whatever we want. Jesus said, you're a son of hell. Woo! I love Jesus. Amen. Therefore, according to the words of Jesus, religion is one of the greatest obstacles to the kingdom. Remember, heaven is the kingdom on earth. Therefore, it's the, it's the colony of God. You ever heard of colonies? Weren't we started as a colony? Uh -huh. You know, we started with English colonies over here, and that's why we speak English. That's why we drive on the right side of the road, all that English. We, we talk English. We don't talk their kind of English. Hallelujah. But on the flip side, when they, all, they sent ambassadors, the king never came over. He sent ambassadors over. Did you know that you are an ambassador of the colony, in the colony, here on earth? Amen. God sent you as an ambassador, the Scripture says, of heaven. That's who you are. You, you don't even realize it at times. So listen, most so-called Believers or Christians, they haven't earned the title Christian. I'm going to say that to you again. We ain't earned the title Christian. Don't go around telling me you're a, you're a believer in Christ. But until you start discipling yourself to be like Jesus, don't tell me you're Christian. Oh, I'm Christian. I got born. No, I've seen how Jesus acts. I see what Jesus do. Why don't we just call you a believer for a little while? until you get your discipleship together to become more like Jesus.
Well, that's hard preaching. You don't go hear it in other churches. What believers do to be more like Jesus is dis discipline. Discipline. Discipline ain't fun. How many realize discipline ain't fun? If you in sports, discipline ain't fun. All that, all that training and practice to get ready to do something, it ain't fun. You know, I, I, again, you know this already. I started golfing again because of Pastor Joseph, and so I started going. But one of the things I don't do, I don't warm up. I don't stretch. I don't practice. I got this in my head. It's like riding a bicycle. I did it 20 years ago. HD, I can do it again. And I went out and I started playing. And sure enough, on a real hard swing, watching another athlete play the game, hitting the ball far, I thought I could do that. But again, I did not practice. I have not warmed up. I have not stretched. And then pow! I found myself a chauffeur <laughs> taking that athlete around everywhere because I popped something back here somewhere between my hammy and my buttocks. And it still ain't healed up yet. Why did that happen, Pastor? Because I didn't practice. I didn't stretch. I took it for granted that this is just a real easy sport. It is easy. But it's still a sport. And I needed to stretch. And as a believer, I want you to know that discipline ain't always fun. Listen, Hebrews 12, 11 says, No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who've been trained by it. So it's important to train yourself in the gospel, to train yourself to do what's right. Dis disciples, discipline, amen. The one who follows the disciplines of the mentor. Who was my mentor is Jesus. So I got to follow what he does. So what does he tell me? Matthew chapter 6, verse 2. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets and be honored by men. I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. There's nothing more blessed to me than to be able to give somebody something in secret, just to bless them. I, and I will do it to people I don't even know. I will find them and bless them. I think it's an important thing. That's what Jesus taught us here. And then he says, verse 5, when you pray, so when you give and when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray, standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by men. I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. Jesus taught us that when you pray, enter your closet that word closet is in the uh, is in the uh, greek language is a, a prayer room a storage room a quiet room everything you need from god is in your closet your deer is in your closet your new gun is in your closet amen your new vacuum cleaner ma'am is in your closet pull it out and vacuum amen whatever you need <laughs> He's in your closet. So I started learning to pray. Go into your closet and pray. He said, there inside that closet, that's what you're going to get it. And if it lines up with the Word of God, you're going to get that. So when you pray, get that. Uh, then he says, when you fast, do not look somber as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show men they are fasting. I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. So Jesus is saying about giving and praying and fasting, if you are constantly allowing people to see that and observe that, you've got your reward already. Oftentimes when I fast, I carry a toothpick in my mouth. So nobody asks me. When you got a toothpick in your mouth, then they think you've already ate. So I just do something like that. Amen. And again, as we fast, we're going to do it as a corporate body. So we're able to encourage one another. Amen. Just like the Ninevites did. They all fasted together. People fasted. All through Scripture, people, almost every religion, by the way, fast. But it was God that taught us to fast, to take control of our bodies, to look after these and don't let this overcome our, our, our spirit or our soul. Amen. To look after that. So he said, when you fast. And I, I remember as a young believer, first off, I didn't know how to pray. I didn't know how to give and I didn't know how to fast. I didn't, know, I didn't even know they existed. I knew prayer existed because I heard people talking about it. But I didn't know how to pray. I didn't know how to fast. I didn't know how to give. I didn't understand. So when I was learned, taught how to give, I understood it was about a tithe, about 10%, and then offerings on top of that. I've been doing that for over 40 years. And I didn't even argue with God. This morning, I, I wrote my tithe check out. It was just that simple. It's, it's, not, it's something that I do. I think it's something every believer should do. And then he said pray. So learning to pray, I used to come always to, to certain places to pray. Then I found out I could pray anywhere at any time. 
I could talk to God. It's not like God had a window closed, and all of a sudden he opened it at 4 o'clock in the afternoon and said, okay, go ahead. I love the fact that God is always on the line. God's phone number is Jeremiah 33, 3. Call unto me and I'll answer you. Amen. Call me. I'll answer you. He's always open. He's already always ready to hear. And then when it comes to fasting, oh my goodness, I was talking about fasting. I thought, how you do that? They should just, just don't eat. What do you mean don't eat? Just don't eat. I live to eat. I like eating. I can't afford it, but I like eating. Now I can afford it, but I can't eat because it's unhealthy. Isn't that terrible? I mean, when you really want a really good steak or chocolate and you're in your 20s, you can't afford it. Then you get in your 60s, you can afford it, but you can't afford to eat it. It's a terrible thing, Kenny. It's a terrible thing. Now I've got to eat total. So the Hebrew word for fasting simply means to cover the mouth. Now listen to me. When I cover my mouth, it doesn't only mean that I quit eating. It also means I quit cursing. If you could fast cussing for 21 days, letting them words slip out of your mouth that you keep telling everybody, well, I, I, I just say what I think, you're a fool. You're foolish if you just say what you think. The worst thing ever happened to you is opening your mouth or typing or posting what you think. The reason you think it first is so that you don't post it, type it, text it, or say it. Type it and then erase it. <laughs> Do not hit send. Amen. You like your job, don't you? Don't hit send. The Greek word for fasting simply means to abstain. The Jews were commanded by God to fast. This illustrated their submission to his will. So fasting takes discipline, self-control. Fasting releases your potential. You don't know what's inside of you. There's a seed inside of a potential inside of every one of us. You know, it's what you see. It's not all there. When I look at people, I realize there's potential in there. It's not what is, but what could be. Amen. It's in the soil. It's in the, Frank, it's in the soil. You don't know what seed that is. You planted that seed. Amen. Hopefully you put a little patch there so we know that's, that's, a, that's a, a beans or corn or watermelon. But inside there, but watching that seed grow is potential. Seeing it come up out of the ground, the exciting thing. In every seed, there's a tree. In every fish, there's a school. In every sheep, there's a flock. In every cow, there's a herd. Billy, every cow, there's a herd. Amen. Hear that, Sue? Yeah, amen. In every girl, there's a woman. Tragedy strikes when a tree dies in a seed, a man in a boy, a woman in a girl, an idea in a mind. For untold millions, visions die unseen, songs die unsung, plans die unexecuted, futures die buried in the past, the problems of this world go unanswered because potential remains buried. Fasting brings that out of us where something happens. It could be cures. There could be seeds. Amen. That pop out and potential takes place. In a fast the believer chooses for a set time to do without something. Not all the time. You choose your time. You choose if you want a half a day, a full day, three days, a week. Amen. Some go weeks with, uh, fasting. Jesus went 40 days fasting. Not without water. You got to take liquids in. You got to look after yourself. This is done so that it does not come between the believer and God. And so it can, cannot act as a God over that relationship and over the life of a believer. I'm telling you, there are idols that you have in your life you don't even realize. You think, you think the idol is the thing you walk into the Chinese restaurant and rub its belly. That's not an idol. That thing's never come between you and God except for one hour on a Sunday morning after church. The only time that it becomes an idol. Is when something comes between you and God. And you got to ask yourself, has that become an idol? Has this thing come between us? When we have anything in our lives that we don't or can't say no to, then it is Lord over us. If something else takes up God's place in our lives, again, idolatry. And we're living in something like that. So there are two types of fasting. There's full fasting. Whoo! Amen. Jesus did that again for 40 days. Uh, 40 days. He had water, no food. Extended period without food. Second, partial. Partial is, is what Daniel did. 
Daniel in the Old Testament and the three Hebrew boys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And don't tell me, don't tell me, I don't need to fast. Listen, if you had the ability to get control over yourself, to start exercising, uh, watching what you eat, what, what if you decide Daniel's fast was about soup? That's what he did. He said, please test your servants for 10 days. He, I've said this about Daniel. Daniel was kidnapped, brought into exile, into the Babylonians. When they brought him in, they removed his ability to reproduce. They made him a eunuch. They did the same for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Now, first, I'd be bitter at you for murdering my parents. Second, I'd be bitter at you for removing my reproductive abilities. And now you've done it to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. See, we don't always understand the, the, the hatred that was going on at this time. Now he's become a servant in this kingdom. And as that, they begin to feed them good food, shine them up, amen, make them healthy. And Daniel said, you know, my way of life is not that. I want to ask you a question, he said. Please test your servants for 10 days. Give us nothing but vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then compare our appearance with that of the young men who eat the royal food, all that, all that fat and stuff, and treat your servants in accordance with what you see. So he agreed to this and tested them for 10 days. At the end of the 10 days, they looked healthier and better nourished than any of the young men who ate the royal food. Let me help you. Your complexion will clear up. You will start, uh, this may sound a little gross, but your body will start pushing out poisons and getting rid of, of things out of your body, out of your pores. You might little, need a little deodorant during that time, but it's going to push out some stuff that you no longer need. Things start happening to you. Your mind will get clear. Your vision will get clear. You'll start smelling roses better than one another. Everything starts changing. You get healthier. Because what we've done, we've masked life by what we've taken in over and over again. See, we are everything we take in. That's who we are. We thought ourselves into people we are and what we bring in. And I, I'm not picking on you. I'm just asking you to take a little time over the next few weeks and decide, you know what? I can do this thing. Everybody say, I can do it. I heard you. Fasting is designed to put wings on your prayers, not that Red Bull. Fasting is designed to drive back oppressing powers of darkness. It loosens the captives. It'll give a child of God an edge over the enemy. Fasting with prayer says, I mean business. Fasting often brings pressure for breakthrough to come in warfare. Some of you have been fighting against addictions, and you start fasting, all of a sudden, boom, you have a breakthrough. You thought it was Nicoderm that done it. It was fasting in the Holy Ghost that did it for you. Fasting tests and strengthens your self-control. Again, a lack of discipline causes many to waste their time or spend it selfishly. You'll neglect church. You'll, you'll fail to accomplish God's work. So why should I fast? The book of Jonah to change God's mind. Y'all remember Jonah? Jonah was a prophet. He had a prophet's card in his billfold. He said, I'll go where God says go. Do what God says do. When God says do it. God came to Jonah the prophet and he said to Jonah, I want you to go to Nineveh. Jonah said, no, I ain't going there. These are the very people that chops the heads off of our, our Israelites and they put them in the city in the corner. I ain't doing it. I ain't going there. So, you know, there are times in life that we just absolutely become disobedient to the things that God tells us. And God told him to go. And Jonah said, I ain't going. I ain't ain't going down there. So Jonah hopped in a boat, amen, and he took off the opposite direction. Now, you've got to read it. It's only a couple of chapters. But on his way there, he, he got into a place where, where uh, the boat started getting tossed, like this right here. And the people on the boat, they were pagans, and they just started rolling dice trying to figure out what happened here. And they just believe in, you know, people on boats are very, very superstitious. Very, watch that, that deadly catch thing. You got one dude knocking on little things over here, and they doing all kinds of stuff. They scared. So at that moment, Jonah realizes he's sleeping in a hammock. He's asleep. And they realize it's this foreigner on the boat. And they go down and knock on the door. Jonah, wake up. We need to talk to you. Jonah wakes up and looks around, and the storm is water is breaking over. The, and here's the thing. Jonah says to him, uh, guys, listen, unless you throw me overboard, this ship's going down. 
And they said, uh, no. Nah. So they start lightening the load. They're throwing all their, their corn over and, and, and their coffee over and their liquor over. And the, and the storm's still coming. They're sacrificing to whatever's out there on the water. And finally, Jonah says, hey, you got to get me out of here. I'm telling you, you're going to go down unless you throw me off the boat. Now, first off, he's fixing to sacrifice himself because if he goes over, he's dead. You know that. He's dead. But he would rather die than go to Nineveh. I'd rather die than be obedient to God and go to Nineveh. I do not want to go to Nineveh. I hate them Ninevites. We that way. We that way. We, we, we like our culture and who we are. I'd rather, I'd rather die than go over to the Middle East. I'd rather die than get around these times. So, so he said, you got to throw me over. So they said, all right, well, uh, if that's what if that's the case, y'all get him by the hands, I get him by the feet, and we're gonna throw him over. Amen. One, two, three, and they threw him over. Well, when he hit the water, the scripture says God had prepared a fish. Now we understand now by the New Testament it was a whale. That God prepared a whale. This now this is this gets me. In other words, God knows that you're gonna be disobedient. God knows you ain't listening. God knows you're going to audit the class. So God says, huh? You want to jump? You want to be thrown over? You want to die? I ain't going to let you die. You ain't going to die yet. Not yet. Till you do as I say. You hear me? So they throw him over, and God prepared this well. So you can see, as the ship was going away, I don't know, when that little whale was just a little minnow, and he started growing up, and he thought to himself, I wonder what I'll be. And he started getting bigger and bigger. And he realized, I'm growing faster than any other fish out here. I'm getting so big. I'm so big. I wonder what God has prepared for me in this life. And as that whale began to grow and got bigger and bigger, God put a sensor on him and said, put a GPS he said, I need you to go and find this dude that's fixing to get thrown over. So the whale was waiting right outside the boat. He did waiting. Nobody saw the whale. Jonah sure didn't. And all of a sudden, they threw Jonah overboard. And the people had to look over, and all of a sudden, they see this Malcolm up and swallow him. There he goes. And the storm went just like that. Everything was calm. It was nice. Oh. He was the bad guy. No, he's not the bad guy. He's the guy that saved y'all's butt. So now he in the mouth of the whale, and he's sitting in darkness for 71 hours and 55 minutes. Three days, he's in the belly of the whale. Oh, this ain't good. Can you imagine the darkness, the smell, the slime? God I just went from a boat of disobedience to hell. That's where I'm at right now. I'm in hell. This is, this is dark. It's nasty. It stinks in here. All this acid in here is washing out my blue jeans. I got acid washed jeans now. Hey, man, I'm a mess. I got seaweed wrapped around my head like a bandana. It's a mess. Read it. It's, he had seaweed wrapped around him when he got it. And, and, then, and then he began to pray. And you can read Jonah's prayer. Jonah's prayer takes five minutes. So, Pastor, how you know he's in there for 71 hours and 55 minutes? Because he was in there for three days. And at the end of three days, the whale barfed him out. So it only took five minutes to read his prayer. And his prayer was a prayer of repentance. How many know God put you in a fix to fix you? His prayer was a prayer of repentance. God, I did wrong. I think Jonah realized something. I'm coming out of this whale one way or the other. I'd rather come out this way than that way. Everybody follow me? Okay, you're a good church. You know where I'm going. So he began to pray, and he said, God, help me. And as he prayed, the well began to regurgitate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You ever been there? Before I got saved, I was there several times. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You go, you go running through the house as quick as you can because you know something's fixing to happen. Get to the bathroom and finally somebody left the lid down. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
and he blew Jonah. Read it, read it, read it, read it. You got to read it. He blew Jonah up on dry land. Amazing story. I mean, not in the water. Threw him up. I mean, he went airborne. Dry land. Hits the ground. Sand. Seaweed. Nasty. Slime. Rolled up. Probably looked like a, a Cuban cigar rolled up in the sand. Gets up. Stretches out. Walks toward Nineveh. You know what he said to the Ninevites when he got there? I love this part. When he got there, he said, in 40 days, God's going to kill every one of y'all. Hallelujah. <laughs> Read it. He never, never asked them to repent. He didn't. All they had to do was take one look at him and realize if this is God's prophet and this is what God would do to his prophet, we're getting right. So they fasted. The Ninevites believed God. They declared a fast, and all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. as a garment of repentance. When God saw that they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he had compassion. That's grace. Amen. And did not bring upon them the destruction he had threatened. Wow. Don't we serve a wonderful God? So fasting turned the whole nation around. It changed everything in the place. Listen to me. When God defers an evil day, it could mean the salvation of multitudes. Your fasting may not affect you as much as it does America. Your fasting may not affect you as much as it does Houston. Your fasting may not affect you as much as it does Crosby. Amen. Your fasting may not affect you as much as it does your business. Are you hearing me? It turns things around. Amen. It shifts things. Uh, Isaiah 58, your fasting ends in quarreling. I got to start closing here. And strife. God got on to him in Isaiah. He said, and is striking each other with wicked fists. You cannot fast as you do today and expect your voice to be heard on high. Is this the kind of fast I have chosen? Only a day for a man to humble himself? It is only for bowing one's head like a reed and lying on sackcloth and ashes? And what you call a fast, a day acceptable to the Lord? See, they made it into religion instead of relational. Is not this the kind of fasting I've chosen to loose the chains of the, of the injustice, to untie the cords of the yoke, and to set the oppressed free and break every yoke? Is it not to share your food with the hungry and provide for the poor, wander with shelter? Then you see the naked to clothe them and not to turn away from your own flesh and blood? Do you realize that when you're fasting how much money that you're saving? that you're able to take your money and be a blessing to somebody else who do not, they don't have food, they don't have clothes, amen, and look after them. And then he said the result is this, then your light will break forth like the dawn, your healing will quickly appear, then your righteousness will go before you, and the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. Then you will call on the Lord, he's going to answer you, and uh, you will cry for help, and he will say, here I am, if you do away with the yoke of oppression, with the pointing finger, the malicious talk. So here's the thing. He said, when you fast and be careful, because you want to punch somebody. Now, the issue is, is when you're fasting, you get irritable. Say you start, you say, I'm, I'm going to fast coffee. I'm going to fast uh, uh, sodas or whatever. And that's been your go-to thing. I got to have a cigarette. That's been your go-to thing. And all of a sudden you quit. If somebody says something to you, rah, 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 rah. you don't bite somebody. He said, don't do that. Don't fight. Don't quarrel. Have a Snickers. Eat a steak. It better do that than to, than to hit somebody. Break your fast if you have to. Don't be mean and malicious. And he said, when you do the right thing here, it's going to give you revelation. Bing, the lights will start going on. Your Bible will start coming alive to you. Second, you'll renew your health. You get your health right. Did you know that when your body, when you get sick, when I mean really sick, your body will start fasting? Your body will shut down. So that's it. That's it. No more Hershey's. No more sneaking candy at night. No more late night tater chips. It shuts you down. And your body is shut down so it can heal itself. Your health. And then he said, I'll be your rear guard. I'll take care of your blind side. Fasting is designed to put wings again on our prayers. Amen. Scripture says the violent take it by force. Sometimes you've got to say, you know, I'm going to do this. If I have to do it forcefully, I'm going to do it. He wants, Martin Luther said this, and this is the Martin Luther of the, of the, uh, the first Martin Luther. 
He wrote the 99 Thesis and knelt it on the Wittenberg door in Germany about Reformation by faith. He said he wants nothing at all to do with you if by your fasting you court him as if you were a great saint. And yet, meanwhile, nurse a grudge or anger against your neighbor. It's a powerful statement. Don't act like you're a super saint just because you fasted for three hours or a day. You know, I mean, it's, it's, it's for your benefit that you do it. Can I get an amen? Well, what's it do, Pastor? It'll loose the bonds of wickedness. It'll undo heavy burdens. It feeds the hungry, shelters the poor, clothes the naked. Our light will break forth. Healing will rise. You'll cry, and I'll answer you. Matthew 6, 17. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face. I remember the days, being a young pastor, that I would take oil, and I would uh, take it out, and I would line everybody up that wanted to fast and put oil on their head. It made me feel like that, that shepherd jacking with the sheep. Slap them on the head. Then I realized, y'all ain't sheep. You lions. You anoint your own head. Amen. It says there, but put oil on your head and wash your face. And I have never washed any of your faces. I ain't never said, come here, let me wash your face. I ain't washed your feet. I ain't washed your face. So why should I anoint you at all? The Scripture says you anoint yourself at all. So for years, we've been buying these little oil sticks and asking you to put one in your pocket. If I could get a couple of your servant leaders to come up here and help me. Whoop, there went one. I got some right there, Tommy, in that bucket. H got some right here in this bucket here. Amen, right here, Tommy. Let me give you some more there. If you, if you want one, give me, give me one. If you want one, go ahead, pass them out. Take one. When you fast, not if, when. I'm asking this to be a corporate fast. You don't have to. But I don't want you to audit this class. I want you to be a doer of the Word. If you're a teenager, I want you to be a doer of the Word. Oh, if you're a kid, I'd love for our kids to do it. Our adults to do it. But when you fast, put oil on your head. Wash your face so that it will not be obvious to men that you're fasting, but only to your Father who's unseen. And your Father sees what is done in secret will reward you. It's a divine priority. Pastor Joseph, will you open this for me? So I don't spill it up here. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. It's a priority. I don't know how it works. Let me be honest with you. I don't know how it works. I just want to be obedient. I don't know how aspirins work. I just want to be obedient. I can tell you this, that when I'm fasting, I often will get cramps in my legs. It's just how my body's made. I have to drink a lot of water. I have to take potassium, something that keeps me from cramping up. Be smart. Be wise. I mean, some of you may have to ask your doctor. Uh, According to where you're at. Maybe if it's not food, it's something else you can fast. But I'm asking you not to audit this class, but to be doers. I'm asking you this month, the rest of this month, do not post any pictures of your food. Do you know how old that gets? Do you know how many wonderful food commercials are on during the month of January? Did you know that every January, Burger King runs two double beef sandwiches for five bucks? And I miss it every January. When you fast. Now, I want you to take a little bit, because I, I, I think just a little bit will do you. Don't have to pour the whole bottle on your head. I want you to take a moment. 
I want you to think. God, what is it that I have between me and you? What is it that I can do that change things? How is it that I've been disobedient like Jonah? And then I want you to take a little oil and I just want you to put it on your head. Let me pray for you. Father, I thank you for the house of lions. We're a tribe that worships the king. We're a tribe. We're known as Judah. Loud praise. That's who we are. We ask you to help us during this time over the next three weeks. Anoint ourselves. God, we thank you for an anointing. An anointing is an unction. It is a power above what we have. It's something sent from the kingdom, from above to earth. Forty days you fasted. Forty days you fasted, and then you were hungry. But during those 40 days, you met with, with your son, and you changed his life in such a way, so much power, that even Satan himself could not tempt him. Father, I thank you in the name of Jesus that you strengthen us, give us revelation, be our rear guard, and bring healing into our bodies in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Amen. Come on, give God praise. Amen. Don't audit this class. Be ye doers of the word, not hearers only, thereby deceiving oneself. Amen. If I get our servant leaders to come back and help me. If you know somebody that you'd like to present this message to who's not here today, you'd like to give them some oil, you're, wel you're welcome to take more than one and uh, bring it to them. Bless them with it. Keep that with you in your pocket next to your change. And as you're moving through, do this. You know, sometimes we get a headache. And we want to take an aspirin. When you get that to that place and you get weak, anoint yourself with oil again. Pray over yourself. If you, can't, if you don't have the oil with you, use some WD-40. <laughs> Amen. Just spray it in there and run through it. Just, I love the smell of WD-40. It just smells good, man. I said, that man working right there when I smell that. Sister out there turning wrenches. Come on, girl. Hey, Amen. That's good stuff. As we give today, we're believing God for? God More money, less hours. Benefits, sales and commission, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, finding money, bills paid off, settlements, inheritance, rebates and returns, debts demolished, royalties received, favor, success to the kingdom. Pastor Joseph.